the way that I live my life has an impact on a farmer living on the slopes of eastern Congo going into Lake Tanganyika in so many different ways, whether it's the minerals that I need for my cell phone to operate to the activities that I'm doing that have an impact on changing weather patterns. Um, we're actually really connected. Hello, damn good family. Welcome to Let's Give a Damn, a podcast about people who give a damn, by people who give a damn, and for people who give a damn. Thank you so much for being here this week. You, my friends, could be doing a million other things right now, but you're here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. My guests today are Philippe Lazaro and Christy Hyzenga Renault. Philippe and Christy are part of the Plant with Purpose team. What is Plant with Purpose? So glad you asked. Plant with Purpose equips farming families around the world to increase farm yields, heal damaged ecosystems, improve nutrition, and increase household savings and opportunities. Their approach solves two major issues facing the world today, environmental degradation and rural poverty. Another way to say it is that they reverse deforestation and poverty around the world by transforming the lives of the rural poor. Since our chat is about the environment and food and sustainability and things like these, we met at a park in downtown LA to record our conversation. It felt like the right thing to do, to meet outside while we had our chat. We talk about the environment. We talk about sustainability, how we can and should make the world a little bit smaller. We talk about a podcast we are creating for their organization and so much more. These two humans impressed the hell out of me. I'm so grateful for their work and I'm pumped you get to hear more about it right now. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Philippe Lazaro and Christy Hyzenga Renault. Let's go. Christy and Philippe, welcome to the Let's Give a Damn podcast. Hi, thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. thanks for coming all the way down or all the way up. <laughs> People always say that, don't they? They always like, let's go down and it could be east, west, north, or south. Thank you for coming up to LA. We are in an amazing park in uh, Boyle Heights, LA. A very, uh, a, a, a very perfect place for the conversation we're about to have, which we'll do with lots of things, but among those, the environment, climate change, our part in all of that. So I'm very excited to be sitting in this park uh, at a picnic table. Uh, with you both. So thank you for both for being here. So let's let's begin with, I'm going to ask each of you to share a little bit about your story. I just want to know what, if I say to you, what are the people, places, and things that have made you who you are today? Whatever comes to mind, just share that because it'll give us obviously some context for the kinds of things you've done in your life and the kind of thing you're doing right now, which we'll talk about. So Philippe, why don't you uh, go first? Sure, yeah. So I was in high school the very first time I was introduced to injustice in a way that really sunk home with me. And it was seeing documentaries and learning a lot about the Darfur crisis, about the use of child soldiers in that part of the world, and human trafficking and a lot of things that went with it. And my first reaction was honestly anger. Just like I was furious that there were people who let that happen to other people who mm. were, were going out of their way to cause human suffering to that scale to kids who are really young and vulnerable. And I just by nature or personality or whatever, usually biased towards optimism. I think I have a hopeful and positive view on the world and, and seeing something like that really contrasted with that mm. and trying to process. I still overall think that it's it's a good world, but but what do we do with things like that? Um, how do we make sense of, of the suffering and other people's pain? Part of being an optimist is also just wanting to naturally be a hands-on person. And if I am aware of something like that going on, I just felt like I couldn't do anything about it. So that led me to realize that working for nonprofits and being able to use your career in a way that would uh, address those issues, maybe not even just through a nonprofit, but in some way w was an option. And I wanted to explore that as much as I could. So I graduated, I went to college and then grad school. I studied nonprofit management and international development. So I really wanted to do something just right along those lines. Um, but more so than that, I just tried to get out there and get as many hands-on experiences as I could. I said yes to hmm. any opportunity to go travel, to go intern somewhere, and to go 
volunteer, and that, that led me to some really interesting spots. One of the first things I did out of graduating was work for an organization that advocated for refugees leaving North Korea hmm. um, and trying to raise some awareness for that issue. Another thing I got to do was uh, tag along with my girlfriend, now wife, to an uh, internship she did in London, trying to um, work on issues of human trafficking there. A lot of people being uh, victimized out of Eastern Europe and brought to uh, a rougher part of London and being forced into prostitution. Um, and then a, a, another thing I got to do was to learn about refugee issues by going to a refugee camp in, in Thailand and, and learning really a lot about um, human rights there. Uh, and so I had this real desire to go do something. And, and what I really kind of wanted to do was to find something that resonated with me the way I felt when I first learned about Darfur to kind of discover this, this crisis or this unmet need and to see, okay, this is my thing that I can address and here's something I can do. Did you, growing up, it seems like you, on accident and on purpose, probably back and forth, like, <laughs> put, you know, you, you had things in front of you to tackle and to wrestle with and deal with. And were there other people around you? Like, was it you doing the work or did you have, you know, f family, friends, parents, you know, teachers that were also saying like, hey, Philippe, like, look at this, do this, like, look what's going on over here. Or were you sort of having to make it up as you go? It was honestly a bit of both. And I think now looking back, it's clear that I did have those people and those sure. elements in there. Um, one thing is I didn't just grow up, I still am Filipino-American, but having that exposure to do two different cultures um, was one thing. And, and I had family that lived um, all over the world. From, from an early age, I got to go visit an uncle in Cairo and just be exposed to, to different settings. And so I kind of had that awareness. And, and running on a second track... I also have a few members of my family. I'm thinking of one aunt in particular who are just extremely generous um, and do, she does everything in her power to, for other people. It's just all about others. She moved to the U.S. in the 50s um, as a, a single Filipino woman to work as a doctor in Philadelphia. And, and that, just flying across the world to do something like that, was not common then and there. I mean, it's still not very common, but especially given the time and place. And she worked herself um, to be just a well-respected and recognized doctor, earned a, what I believe is a pretty good living, but always lived well under her means. Mm. And what she did with that amount of margin she created, she, these are just what I know about. She sent a priest to seminary in the Philippines. She paid for her younger siblings to go to school, including my dad, and leading to the life I got to enjoy. Wow. She supported small businesses being started up, not as a nonprofit organization, not as a philanthropist, just as her. And so I think I always aspired to something like that, but it took a while for me to see what that might look like in the context of my own life. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Uh, Christy? Yeah. We, we just had a, we have an ATV going by our picnic table. Just <laughs> for everybody wondering, this is a park. So there are planes going overhead and we're at what, 150 feet from the road. Yeah. And yeah, this Toro ATV just went by. So um, those are beautiful noises of people going around. Christy, <laughs> share, yeah. share uh, some of your story with us. In a lot of ways, my story is a lot like Philippe's, a little bit longer, so I'm going to give you the short version. But I also grew up kind of as, my parents described me as a third culture kid. I grew up in an area where it was quite different, and they embraced that. So Yeah, really, was that intentional? Yes, intentional, really lived a life of generosity and service in a much more materialistic culture. And so kind of got that, that upbringing from the very beginning. Um, Similar to Philippe, I started out my career thinking about human trafficking. Um, not the bad side of it, hopefully. I worked for an organization that now calls itself the world's largest anti-slavery organization for quite a few years. And I did a lot of work in South Asia with um, kind of stopping human trafficking rings. I was working with a lot of undercover investigators and kind of doing some, some fun behind the scenes kind of coordinating for intelligence work. It was just this crash course in a lot of challenges that the world faces, ways that people have found themselves in situations of violence and just terrible stories mm. that I, I had exposure to that at the time not a lot of people were hearing about. So in some ways, I'm really similar to Philippe. I think that, well, Philippe describes himself as driven by a sense of optimism. I probably see myself more driven by the adventure that comes in problem solving. And so for me, I was looking at these, these trafficking rings and these terrible situations of slavery and violence and thinking, 
how can I change this? And I saw myself as a white woman in South Asia and just realized that honestly, I probably wasn't the best person to, to deal with the symptoms of trafficking, but I might be much better suited to tackle the root causes. So I went upstream, literally and figuratively, into rural poverty and found that the vast majority of girls that we were dealing with came from the hillsides of Nepal or some of the floodplains of Bangladesh, um, places where there were very little opportunities, especially for girls, and very little hope available. So I just kind of looked at, at my skill set and, and who I am and had some really wise people speaking into me saying, go to business school mm. and try to see if you can figure out ways to address the root causes of this violence, which in many cases were rural poverty. So did that. Found myself now working with Plant With Purpose, diving into rural poverty. I started from rural finance uh, and that kind of took me down this path where I, I learned a ton about what works, what doesn't work, and realized that actually one of the most effective solutions to rural poverty, which is the largest form of poverty around the world today, is sustainability. It's thinking creatively about how do we actually restore the land in a way that helps lift people out of poverty. So these days I'm one of the directors at Plant With Purpose, which is an organization that solely focuses on that particular issue and from a faith perspective. I love it. And we're going to touch on much more of that here in a minute. What was your earliest memory of giving a damn? So for some people, it's sort of like they can't remember like the moment and it's more of a progressive thing for them. But many people like there was a thing there was meeting someone or doing something that it was like, oh, I can never it's basically the point of no return is what I'm asking. Like you got to a point where it was like, I, I can't unsee what I saw. I can't unfeel what I felt. I have to do more of this. Was there a moment like that for you? There were a few. Uh, when you ask about the earliest one, I kind of giggled because I have this distinct memory of being like seven, I think, and watching a news show with my parents about how Japanese kids were better in math than Americans. And I was like, no way. I'm not going to let that happen. <laughs> I was just, it bothered me. And it was kind of this entrance into understanding that the world is really diverse mm. and there's so many different people out there. It was probably that light bulb moment for me to think outside of just what I know yeah. into a much broader context. Probably the big shift moment for understanding the problems of poverty and giving my life a direction was in college. I spent um, a semester abroad living in Honduras in Tegucigalpa and it was my first, my first intensive and long time away from my culture sure, yeah. in a place where I was completely foreign. Uh, I was just struggling with Spanish and I lived in someone else's home. And it was a bit of a shock, but it was also this moment where I realized that a lot of what I just took for granted as this is just the way that the world works is not the case. And the world has many beautiful cultures and many beautiful ways of living. and what everybody expected of me wasn't necessarily the way that I had to choose to live my life. So. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Philippe? And do you have any big light bulb point of no return moments? I, I do. And it's kind of similar to Christy. So I mentioned I was on this around the world journey, just looking for where to, where to input my life and my energy to do something. And one of the spots that it led me where that really lasted with me was South Africa. Mm. Um, through some personal connections, I got in touch with a a care center for orphans and vulnerable children and offered to spend a few months living there and, and helping out. And here's what I expected. I expected to get there, to be kind of given a task. This is what you can do. Here's how you'll see it, it really helping these kids. And you can run with that, go figure out how to go home and figure out how to take it to the next level. I got there and the director of the center uh, was out for an extended period of time because he was having um, a surgery. Uh, the only people around were care mothers who just kind of were managing the day-to-day -day care of the really young kids, but they didn't really know what to do with a volunteer from the U.S. I was also in one of just the most dangerous neighborhoods of the area where me leaving the center and I didn't have any mode of transportation would not have been a, a smart idea. So I was stuck in this um, care center all on my own with just these kids around me and no real plan or direction. And for somebody who had all these visions of how to be a hero and go change the world, that was actually the most humbling but ultimately wow, teaching yeah, experience. I <laughs> so I did I did the only thing I, I 
there was left to do, which was just spend as much time with the kids as possible. Yeah, just be. Yeah. Just play, <laughs> be there, yeah. And that was exactly what it was. It was a lot of time hanging out in like the, the teenage boys dormitory, just throwing darts at a wall while talking to them and, and being surprised at the stuff they would be watching on, on the one TV set working. Uh, but some of the things I learned was um, that with the context that they were growing up in, I realized that they had a lot of exposure to some really bad influences. And if they did not have a positive influence that was just as present, just as there, then it was really an uphill battle for, for their totally. lives and their, their future. And I started to realize just how many of the other issues that I'd experienced, things like working with refugees and, and seeing um, other effects of poverty, all kind of tied down to, to the same root causes. And I realized what it takes to change actually create change is different than this this heroic act. It's more about a long-term lasting commitment. It's like what Christy was saying with her journey, looking for those root causes. And also, I realized the most effective people at working with these South African kids and teenagers were, were the people right around them, the, the people who'd been working at that care center for years and years. And so I also realized that the helpers are almost always local. And these are the people who who need empowerment. It's not about coming in as an outsider, but but really learning. And so that set the stage for what I knew, the elements I knew needed to be there for whatever I ended up doing next, which turns out to be Plant With Purpose. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, let's, uh, let's segue into Plant With Purpose then right now. Um, what roles do you both hold there? And tell me about it, because I'm three months into knowing about who you all are and what you all are doing. Very impressed, very excited to learn more about it. And I definitely want those listening to hear about it and see if there are ways that they can contribute to the mission and vision. So what, ro- yeah, Christy start and like, what role do you hold and w- what do you all do? Great. Thank you. These days, I'm the director of development and marketing for Plant With Purpose. I've been there long enough to have done quite a few different roles. I started I, out. I, I know the small team nonprofit world and <laughs> you have a title on your business card. But you've done everything, including probably cleaning toilets and, you know, and yep, at, at some point. So, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I started out working with our Africa area programs and we stuck Thailand into Africa for a while. So spent a lot of time on an airplane traveling to different parts of the world. Uh, Eastern Congo was probably one of my more favorite trips. Mm. Um, but, yeah, a big piece of who Plant With Purpose is, is we're just trying to figure out how do we be effective at that intersection of rural poverty and environmental degradation. We've seen that one of the leading reasons that people are caught in poverty right now, today, is because of land degradation. It could be climate change, it could be local deforestation, it could be bad care of land, it could be industry coming in and turning things up, but that there's this vicious cycle that a lot of families get caught in where what they're needing to do to meet today's needs is actually having a detrimental impact on their long-term ability to care for and provide for their families. And so what we do is we come alongside those families. We don't give anything away. We just teach, train, and equip families to turn that cycle upside down to where they're actually restoring the land in a way that increases their agriculture yields, restores their community, kind of unites entire communities to change some of these structural problems. So I kind of like to think about it as like a little David and Goliath. How do we help these rural subsistence farmers make an actual big change against the huge forces that are, are coming at them in the form of environmental degradation globally. It's probably very rare that they ever feel in control of anything, right? Everything's always happening to them. That's And so to help them realize that they do have stuff they can control and do and contribute, mm-hmm. it's probably so life-giving and empowering to them. I can That's imagine. That's the hardest thing and also in some ways the easiest thing. The yeah. most exciting thing that we do yeah. is offer hope yeah. to people who don't think that they have any hope, but really they have a lot more power than they realize. Yeah, that's really great. Philippe? Yeah, so I'm the creative director and marketing person, uh, storyteller really, and I kind of think I have the fun job, though. I (laughs) hope everyone feels that way about their job on the team, Um, but I get to tell the stories and and share the stories of um, the firsthand lived experiences of the people we're working to empower and to use their stories as 
a bit of evidence to show that there, there are things we can do in the face of, of these big goliaths like climate change, like deforestation, put like a human face on these things that are so often addressed from like a top-down scientific statistical level. And really, if I can kind of get somebody to, to care the way I experienced that feeling when I first learned about certain issues around the world, that to me is, is the big win at the end of the day. It, getting someone to care and getting them interested to invest their resources to go help someone else. Let's get practical for a minute. Numbers. Like, so I, I think people probably now understand kind of the top level, but how is it working out really practically? Sort of what's the, what, what sort of impact are you having and where? Sure. Yeah, we're in eight countries right now, um, the majority of which are in Africa, some in Latin America and the Caribbean, and also in Thailand working with refugee communities. We've seen that in the communities we work, poverty is cut down um, by two thirds. And that's the result of people mm, being- That's awesome. Yeah. And, and the way that happens is people are able to grow more crops. They're more resilient to things like drought and famine um, as they solve the issue of deforestation and start increasing the amount of trees rather than taking them down, their soil quality improves. And, and to me, that's all just a reminder where for as much doom and gloom as there might be for, in the world of talking about the environment, sometimes just doing the simple things that allow just these natural processes of creation to take over and, and get back to the way they're supposed to be running. Um, once you let that happen, it really just lets people thrive. You talk about it too, in terms of just a broader global impact. We talk a lot about the environmental piece of what we do. Sure. Poverty is probably the, the thing that, that connects people. Everybody understands, at least in theory, what it's like to be stuck in poverty and being mm -hmm. able to, to take that and turn it upside down and to actually grow out of poverty is, is really hopeful. But the environmental story is also equally interesting. We often talk about change in vegetation cover just as a way to measure the type of environmental change that we're doing. Sure, yeah. So we're working in watersheds where we actually see a watershed going from getting worse every year to getting better every year. And a big piece of that is reforestation, agroforestry, just small little ways that people can change the way that they farm when done as a community have a huge impact on the ecosystem surrounding them. So if you think about it in terms of, of the climate conversation, it's just one small piece of environment um, and environmental restoration that we can do. But, but climate's what everybody's talking about right now because it's, it's huge and it's urgent and it's in our face. We're currently working with about 40,000 families around the world. We could easily scale that up. We're at a, a, f a phase in our organization's lifespan where we're ready to grow mm. and we want to grow. So we're hoping we can double that within the next few years. But at 40,000 families, we're seeing that each of those families is absorbing through the techniques that they're using to improve their farms and grow out of poverty. They're also absorbing probably about half the amount of carbon dioxide that the average American is responsible for emitting every year. And so kind of putting that at scale, we could be looking at maybe 5% of the amount of carbon that Americans are offsetting with just the current number of families that we're working with right now. Wow. So taking that to scale, the ways that we're practically helping people grow out of poverty have the secondary impact of addressing one of the more compelling and urgent needs that is facing our world right now. You said uh, that you are ready to grow. So what's, what's, why aren't you growing? What, what do you need? We need people. Yeah. We need to get out there. We have been based in Southern California, which is beautiful and wonderful. But I think that in some ways it's been a hindrance for us. We need to, to talk to the rest of the country. Yeah. So we really thank you for this opportunity to just share our story. Yeah. That's really great. Yeah, one thing I'll add, too, is we're, we're a Christian organization. We're completely faith-based and faith-motivated, and we believe that things like poverty and the environmental crisis have spiritual roots. And I think that there are a lot more believers within that faith who have the potential to connect dots between uh, their relationship with creation and the call to love your neighbor in a way that has yet to be fully tapped into. And I get really excited to think about once, once those dots are connected and once this starts taking off with people, what that could look like. You know, just speaking from my own faith lens, I believe that my spiritual beliefs give me a huge sense of importance to take care of the earth and to be a steward of creation. And I think that the more people start realizing just how this isn't just some like 
side accessory to fit, but it's actually a, a huge it's way. It's a central that, part. Yeah, it's a big way you can just practice it as a spiritual discipline, taking care of creation and, and serving other people through it. But there is so much room for that to take off and to hit those levels Christy was talking about. Why do you think, let's spend a minute or two there. So I'm with you in that my faith really propels me forward. Um, it's a lot of work to do. And I can tie so much of that motivation back to my faith. But there are so many, and I'm using air quotes, evangelicals in this country who use their faith as a reason for not doing it. Because somehow they've read the same Bible that you and I have. And what they've gotten out is that the whole thing's going to fucking burn someday. So why, why worry about it? You know what I'm saying? Like they're, they're just like, it's, they have such a bad view of the future that they don't care about reducing, reusing, recycling. They don't care about, if we talk about meat, if we talk about deforestation, we talk about these things, they're just like, eh, like that's not my thing. I just need to take care of my family and do all these things, right? But, but this, and I'm pointing to everywhere around us, I'm pointing to cars and people and grass and trees and like, this doesn't matter to them. Like, so how, in your view, how is it possible that we're, we have the same faith background, but we're coming to two vastly different conclusions? It's really interesting. Diving into that question is just fascinating. And I don't know, I mean, there's no one absolute answer to it. One thing to keep in mind is that American Christianity deviates from a lot of global Christianity on yes, this topic. Yep. We work in Tanzania with the Evangelical Lutheran Church there, and they see creation care, it's kind of an American term for just environmental stewardship, yep. as a core tenant. Central. of their faith. And actually to the point where if you go through confirmation, which every child does in the Lutheran church in Tanzania, you have to plant a tree and you have to see that tree as a representation of your faith and God's act of renewal through you in the world. When you look back at the Bible and you read the Bible from cover to cover, for the most part, it's talking about what hope looks like to a society that looks a lot more like those farmers that we're working with in Africa. Mm. Um, the Bible is written to a predominantly subsistence agriculture society. And throughout the entire history of God and people, God has been talking about restoration of the land, a restoration physically and not just spiritually. But the change in American Christianity is really fairly recent where we've taken faith and made it just a spiritual thing and not a physical not a thing as well. Thing. Not yeah. a holistic thing. And how did that happen? I, I talked to a lot of people and try to figure out where, where did this change come? And the consensus seems to be that the big change happened around the time that Christianity started to side a little bit more with certain political parties. That happened at the same time that the environmental movement kind of sided a little bit more with some Eastern styles of spirituality. Sure. And so I think that a lot of Christians started to, to take on things that were above and beyond just the core tenets of their faith and started to see some ideologies that our culture has associated with Christianity as part of Christianity. So what we're encouraging people to do is to break outside that box. Yeah. Go back to the Bible. Yeah. Go back to the story of, of God and people throughout the history yeah. of the world and understand that, that God created not just people, but also the world and that restoration of the world. What, yeah. what do those final days look like? We don't really know. Yeah. A lot of it is a guess, but the story that seems predominant in the Bible is is both a physical and a spiritual yeah. renewal. Lots of renewal, lots of redemption, lots of regeneration, lots of... Uh, and what's funny though, is even if you get out of, because we have people listen to this podcast that like, I'm a Christian, but most of the people that listen are not Christians. You know, there's people that are Muslim and Jewish and Baha'i and whatever. Like every scripture book, you know, depending on your faith background, also addresses this. Like it is a, it's, it's everywhere which is just why it's so boggling to me that there is really anyone out there that could like just toss, you know, just litter on the floor. Like, how? Like, you have to know that, that that affects you and everybody else around you. That is not like how you eat, how you drink, how you dress, how you behave at home in public. That affects everybody. We definitely have to stop compartmentalizing our faith, whatever it is, for whoever's listening. What, like, that is not just one part of your life. I believe it's a very holistic calling 
that affects everything. It's just always fascinating to me how I can have discussions with people and they're like, yeah, that's not really, um, how is it not, how is it not top of mind? Mm -hmm. Like that's insane to me. Environmental restoration is also a huge tool for peace building. And this is a thing that, mm, that's that we've good. encountered kind of by surprise, but the more I dive into it, the more I realize, no, actually it should be part of, of the design of what we're trying to do. Again, going back to Tanzania where the Evangelical Lutheran Church is a big player in the environmental restoration space, what we see is that Tanzania is a country where about 35% of the population is Muslim. Uh, and the, the areas where we're working, we're talking about a biblical-based environmental restoration curriculum. And so we look at the Bible and we start from there. And that's how we talk to a lot of the people that we work with who are Christian. When we were designing our program, we wondered, do we need to come up with something else to address the 35% of the population that's Muslim? And what, what we found out is that it wasn't necessary because the imams and the local leaders of the Muslim community were coming to us and they were saying, we really love this curriculum yeah. that you're using. It's Bible-based, but that's the part of our religions that overlap. Yes. And yes. can we do this with you? We're totally cool with that. And so it's actually been a way to bring those two communities together. In Burundi and Congo, we see that more of those societies are Christian, but the divide between denominations has been huge. Yeah. And people don't come together, but we can come together saying, we need to restore this field. So let's invite the Catholics and the Methodists and the Pentecostals, and we'll all come together and we'll all pray together, which at the beginning makes everybody really uncomfortable because that's just not done. But if we're thinking about we share this space and we share this watershed and we share this land that needs to provide for our families, and it's all united under one God, how can we do that together? Yeah. So we've seen that it's actually a huge tool for peace building instead of divide. If I could divide my own personal faith journey into like three acts, there's the act where I just was raised within the Christian religion and, and, and taught things. And, and then it was all about kind of the act of escapism, right? You die and then you go off to heaven. Yep. And before that, you can even kind of insulate yourself from things of this world, things that are not godly by sticking to only things that have a certain Christian label on them or, or look very explicitly like a, an act of faith, going to church or participating in a prayer group, all, all potentially good things. But, right. but it ha kind of had this realm of this is where your faith is, try and stay within these lines. Act two, I went through a long phase of questioning things before ultimately coming back around. And this time it's kind of gone from the act of escapism to engagement. I think a lot of times um, there's like this cultural misbelief that we need to protect God from like the, the worldliness around us when instead of seeing how does God fit into all things and what's he actually up to, every time I ask myself that question, it, it paints towards a picture of things coming, becoming restored and whole again. And I, I think that looks so many different ways. It can look like people breaking out of poverty. It can look like tribal leaders in, in the Congo um, reconciling after years of conflict. Mm. And it can look like a watershed that used to be barren and dry and uh, feeling the effects of drought suddenly turning green and just giving birth to all this new life. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. That's I, I love how you integrated that. Christy, before we turn the mic on, you you said the words trying to make the world a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. um, Talk more about that, because I think that's really fascinating. So one of the things that, that I've just encountered personally in my life is that if I sit here in my neighborhood and I talk to only the people that I'm talking to, I get just a small slice of the picture of the world. Yes. When I travel and I meet people, or even if I go to a different neighborhood sometimes, and meet people who are unlike myself, I get a much bigger picture of... I don't know if I'm, I'm speaking from a perspective of faith, I get a much bigger picture of the creativity of my God and the diversity of the world and the beauty that exists beyond just the small little piece that I know. And so kind of taking that to what we do, what we've seen is as we're talking about environmental care and issues like climate change and environmental restoration, when we're only thinking about our neighborhood, we tend to get stuck in the thought of, if I address these environmental challenges, I actually need to sacrifice 
And that's true. That That is a, a definite piece of what we need to talk about. We need to talk about reducing and reusing and recycling. And we need to talk about maybe creatively changing the way that we think about our life, driving less, right. uh, using cleaner energy sources. All of those things are extremely important. And I don't want to downplay that. But what I've found is that we often get stuck in what we can see. And we don't think outside the box. Mm. So... Globally, what we're looking at is there's a huge problem right now in the world where we've addressed a lot of urban poverty. Um, rural poverty is what remains. And we tend to think of rural poor as, as people who are not capable of solving some of these larger problems. Mm. Um, and I think it's just because we have a lack of creativity and it's a lack of understanding of these challenges. So at Plant With Purpose, what we've realized is the way that I live my life has an impact on a farmer living on the slopes of eastern Congo going into Lake Tanganyika in so many different ways, whether it's the minerals that I need for my cell phone to operate to the activities that I'm doing that have an impact on changing weather patterns. Um, we're actually really connected. Yeah. And what's really cool is to see how that farmer in Eastern Congo is not just a passive recipient of the evils of my lifestyle, but also can have a huge act to play in changing the story that we're telling. So that farmer can be working their land in a way that offsets some of what I'm doing, it can be working their land in a way that conserves and protects and regenerates biodiversity, it can be farming land in a way that allows us greater access to things that we've not seen in mm. terms of what are some of the resources that exist in, in those forests right at the top of those hillsides. So I think that in terms of, of making the world smaller, what, what I want to talk about is let's get outside of the thought that it's only America that matters mm -hmm. and start to realize that the world is, is not very big. And those of us who live in different places around the world are connected and are helping each other and not just suffering the consequences of, of one side of the world. So yeah. kind of going back to, to those numbers, we're working with about 40,000 families. We could easily, easily double that to 80,000 families. We could probably take it much bigger than that. There's other organizations similar to us doing this type of work. A huge, huge and often overlooked solution to some of these larger global problems is in empowering and equipping the rural poor to change the way that they live that offers them hope, offers them a chance to, to be actors in the story and not just passive bystanders who have things happen to them. Yeah. You mentioned people becoming aware that America is not, it's definitely not the only country, right? Physically, it's not even near the only country, but also it's not the, like, we, we've got to get rid of this notion that we're the greatest and we're the best and we're the biggest and we're the baddest because what that, it, it insulates us. And now we start thinking that everything that I need can happen here. In other words, if the other 190 plus countries fell off the face of the planet, we'd be able to exist and that's not true we all need each other right and we must expand our view we must get out of our start by getting out of our neighborhood we we, we all live in cities that are big enough that there's parts of the city we've never even been to right and that's not most of america's problems right they they live in all these cities where or the towns where they know pretty much every place but just yeah get out of our like our neighborhood and then our city and then our state and then our country and you'll begin to see how beautiful and amazing uh, these other people and cultures and food and music is and how much we need each other. I right? also think it's extremely important for the health of our country. Uh, we saw in the last election that there was a bit of a surprise um, yeah. in the part of people living in cities to what the center of the country is going through. Yep. And I think that that's just one aspect. I think the same thing is happening globally that some of it's happening, we, yeah. It's happening in our backyard. Yeah. It's, it's happening if you go into the countryside. Out, We're sitting in L.A. right now. If right. you drive just an hour, yeah. you get into an entirely different world. Yep. Yeah, so just thinking outside the box, I think that when we think of only what's in front of us, we lose the creativity, but we also lose a much more beautiful story of what's out there and ways to 
to get to know our neighbor a little bit better. Yeah, that's great. And to serve a little bit better. Philippe, we are making a podcast together. We are. Right? So the three of us, plus our friend Chad and your team, why don't you tell everybody what that's about? Because it's coming, and I want everybody that's listening to just devour that podcast series when it comes out and share it with their friends. I think it'll be a very meaningful tool for conversation. Just what I've seen as we're building up the outline and the interviews you've been getting, I think it's going to be a really great piece of content. So tell us about it. Sure, yeah. So the show is going to be called Grassroots, and we are taking a global look at um, the environmental crisis we're in right now, what people around the world are doing to respond, and and what that means for for people of faith or even people who are just concerned about about this issue. Um, and we're doing it um, a few different ways. So first, we're really looking to to put front and center the voices of the people who are most affected by these issues. Um, we're talking to a lot of farmers. Our very first interview was the other week with um, one of our partners in DR Congo. And um, we're really trying to make it a global show for the reasons we've, we've just yeah. been talking about, yeah. um, really broadening those horizons. We're also trying to go beyond just seeing something at, like climate change or deforestation in only a way that looks at the numbers. Numbers are important and they, they tell a story, but also to look at, at the human side and remember who's being affected by this um, and, and how are they responding. And then the, the third thing we're doing is we're talking to people who aren't just strictly environmental scientists or just working right within the issue, but we've we've also been talking to people who primarily are, are peace builders or, or healthcare workers, people who are farmers and and parents and all kinds of people who interact with the environment some way, because we, we all do. We're really addressing root causes that play themselves out a whole bunch of different ways across other contexts. I love it. And when will this show be out, generally? Generally. We are aiming for a summer release um, okay. sometime by mid-June. I love it. I love it. So everybody listening, I will remind you when it comes out, <laughs> but make sure to go look for it. Okay, let's begin to land this plane. I want to know something from both of you as we wrap up. You're both going to die someday. Hopefully it's many, 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 many years from now, but you're going to die. I'm going to die. I don't want to die just yet, but it could happen anytime. You're going to die someday. And in a hypothetical scenario, I've been asked to give your eulogy. What do you hope that I would say on that day? I'll start with how I think I would want people to feel because I, I know how I feel when I've been impacted by somebody's life. When I, when I think of people who've passed, like maybe someone legendary like Nelson Mandela or even my, my grandma who passed away a couple of years ago is a, a profound sense of gratitude for them. Yes. But also just for my own life. Yeah. Um, and, and for the opportunity I have and, and however many years I get on, on the earth to, to do what I do. And so to feel a sense of gratitude and wanting to make the most out of that, that precious time, I think as far as what you would actually say, I would love it if you were able to say he, he reminded me of, of what hope looks like or he pointed me towards hope, something along those lines. I, I think I began my story by talking about how I was, I, I've been a natural optimist. That's kind of my bias. And, and something I've learned over the past couple of years is that, that hope and optimism really aren't the same thing. Um, you can uh, be totally in touch with the realities of the world, with, with how harsh some people have it, uh, while still holding on to a strong sense of hope. Hope is just that refusal to admit that um, this is the end of the story, yeah. when things aren't looking good. And, and, and you can do that in the face of all kinds of calamity, in the face of global warming and deforestation and all that. The thing that keeps giving me hope is, is I think of the time I get to spend um, in the field visiting with um, our partners and our participants. And when I was in uh, uh, Thailand um, a couple of years ago, I got to spend time with a community where most of the older men were former soldiers when they were teenagers. They, they weren't Thai ethnically. They were from um, another minority group that and had mostly had to flee from, from Burma to escape a regional war. Mm. And one of the guys I spoke to, and this kind of stood out to me because it was this issue that kind of pulled me into to this whole way of life in the first place of um, child soldiers and teen soldiers. And I met this guy named uh, Chaka, and he had his grandson with him. And, and kind of just trying to, to get people to open up and tell me their stories, I, I just asked him, hey, do you, do you think your, your grandson's going to have a, a better life than you? And, and he laughed at me for a second, and then he, he said something really serious. He said, you know... When I was this kid's age, 
we had to kill our dogs because there was a war and, and if they kept barking, they would give our, away our location and we wouldn't be safe. And, and I was trying not to cry because wow. I'm a huge dog lover and yeah. I'm around this, uh, this village in Thailand who I just met. But what that reminded me was that all around the world, you know, you hear about bad things happening all the time, about all the drama in politics and all this top level stuff. And it can really make you think that uh, most of the world has just fallen apart. And when I travel and when I meet people and, and meet folks like Chaka, I realize that like 99.5% of people out there, maybe even more than that, just people who at the end of the day want to pass something better on to their kids or their grandkids. They're people who just want their, their family and their community to, to have a good day and to have life as good as possible. And, and if sort of the things I do on a daily basis for the sake of my family, my community, and my world accomplish that same thing and remind people of that, that same truth, then I, I think it'll have, have been a good life. That's awesome. That is a great life and legacy. Christy? Yeah, I, I would agree with a lot of that. I think that I come from a perspective of faith, and I would love to end my life with people saying, you know, she lived out her faith through love. And I see the ways that she didn't live for herself. She didn't accumulate for herself, but instead gave over and over and over again and showed me a picture of hope in life. And so when I think about the way that I want to raise my kids and the way that I want to lead my life, I would much rather be known to be a person who, who chooses love and who chooses others over myself. And I think... That may mean I don't end up the wealthiest person in the world, and it may mean that I have a couple moments in life where things are a little hard, but mm. I think that through that, I can leave something much more beautiful in the world. It's amazing. I think people might wonder like what there is to do in the, in the face of all these issues we, we talked about, and we mentioned how it is surprisingly easy to actually do something that has an, a proven impact, a lasting impact in the lives of um, farmers around the world of rural villages and people who are living uh if like christy mentioned if you support two families a year through plant with purposes work you're offsetting the amount of carbon you're putting out if you're an average american yeah you know and, and why stop there why think of only just offsetting why not go proactive and, yep. and knock out a few other people's offsets or yeah. or i like to think of you know it, it only costs a dollar to plant a tree through our our partnering villages it's amazing like, you can easily give a village a small forest and have this impact that lasts much longer than the time you get to be on this earth, hopefully, and, and see that have an impact on a community. So I think, you know, is there an obligation to help? Yeah. Is there, are there a lot of reasons we should? Yes. There's also just a lot of fun in doing it and a lot of things to be gained and to be experienced that I, I just get amazed by. That's really, that's really fun. Yeah, yeah, that's great. You also asked earlier, what do we need? Yeah. We need to build an audience. Yeah. So if you're listening, go check out plantwithpurpose.org. Um, tell your friends. Social media at plant w purpose. <laughs> plant w purpose. I will put all of that in the show notes. I will do my best to, uh, yeah, con convey the needs, right? We put a lot of needs in front of our, our listeners, but I hope that a bunch of them see this as a very worthwhile way to to invest some of their their time and energy and dollars and stuff because I, I I'm I'm very grateful and impressed I'm very grateful for you both and for the work you're doing and I'm also impressed with yeah the work that you're doing and I I I wish tons and tons of success on the future as you grow because like like you said multiple times you guys are ready to double and triple and quadruple your impact yeah it just requires money and an audience and resources I I know the nonprofit life very very well I know the limitations and um, it's yeah, it's it's a it's a hard it's a hard endeavor, but super super worthwhile. So I'm I'm grateful for you both. Thanks for being such a strong advocate for sustainability and for caring. That yeah. there's so many different ways to do this out there, and and we're just one small one. So we really appreciate the opportunity to come share and yeah, to of learn course. more. About and right what before we did about. this, yeah, 100. percent Right before we did this interview for everyone that's listening, they interviewed me for their podcast, Grassroots. It's coming out. So if you want to know more of my thoughts on some of the ways that I'm doing this and it, that my family and our neighborhood and our community and some of my thoughts on sustainability, environment, climate change, uh, single use products, all of that. Um, you can listen to their show when it comes out. I'll be sure to point, point that out. So thank you both uh, for joining me. Uh, let's do it again sometime. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Nick.
Thank you so much for listening, friends. Gosh, I loved that conversation so, so much. I hope you enjoyed it and were challenged as well. Each week, I issue a challenge to you as we conclude our conversation. Here's my challenge to you this week. Start small. Do something small today and something small tomorrow and something small the next day and so on and so forth. Make changes in your lives because it's the right thing to do, not because you'll reap the benefits in the near future, because you may not, and that's okay. And if you need help thinking through ways you can help become an advocate for a cleaner and more sustainable environment and planet and future, let me know. I'm super happy to help. Please follow Plant With Purpose on social media at PlantWPurpose. You can find them on Twitter and Instagram at PlantWPurpose. And check out all their work and more ways you can get involved by visiting PlantWithPurpose.org. That's PlantWithPurpose.org. To find more information on this podcast conversation and Let's Give a Damn in general, please go to Let'sGiveADamn.com. If you love what we're doing on this show, please tell a friend. Or you can leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Or consider giving us a few dollars each month to support the production and execution of this show by visiting patreon.com slash let's give a damn. This episode was edited and produced by the incredible, incredible Chad Snavely. The music is by our amazing friend, Propaganda. I can't wait to spend more time with you next week. I love you all. Peace. Peace.